Hello again. Uh, in this video, we're going to do uh, a review of another video. Now, first I need to explain the circumstances of this video. I was online uh, looking at a video rabbi talking about Christianity. Now, the name of that channel was Karite Judaism. And uh, I ended up making a comment on the video and got into a conversation with the man who made the video. He's trying to convince me of leaving Christianity and joining Judaism. And um, through our discussion, he asked me to review this video and to uh, get back to him and let him know what I thought of it. And it turns out to be a two-hour video of a rabbi talking about Christianity, uh, which is interesting. But um, I figured that in order for uh, learning and more discussion among the followers of my channel, that I would make a, a video of me reviewing this video. And now the video we are reviewing is uh, the it's a teaching of a rabbi in Toronto, Ontario. Um, his name is Rabbi Michael Skobak. And the name of their video channel is Jews for Judaism. Um, now, what this seems to be to me is uh, you may have heard of a movement in uh, the Jewish community that is called Jews for Jesus. And um, they're basically Jewish people who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah and accepted the teachings of the New Testament and um, have incorporated this into their lives which was Jewish already and um, they are very active movement I call it Jews for Jesus and uh, I suppose that they're quite active in the synagogues so this is the uh, rabbi who does not believe in Jesus his answer or their answer to the uh, this movement. Uh, now it's very good to me to uh, have discussions like this which are pretty high level of theology and which is very refreshing and um, you know when we see two alternate views coming together we can learn a lot from it. So um, with that in mind, we'll, we'll carry on from here. Now, another thing is that these uh, Jews, they um, do not accept the English Christian translation of the Old Testament. Uh, they have their own scriptures called the Tanakh which is basically the same scripture, scriptures, but a different translation of it. Um, now, the Tanakh, I asked this rabbi, well, what's an acceptable English translation of the Tanakh? Um, so he told me this one, the blue one. And so I found this on Amazon got a good deal on it, they used one. Now you can see there's three sections to this Tanakh. The Torah, the Nava'im, and the Ketuvim. Uh, it's, they have arranged their holy books into a different order than what the Christians have. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, it, it's basically this uh, from the same books. So the first section in the Tanakh, just to, to let you know exactly what's in here, the first section is the Torah. 
which is the five books of Moses. It's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then the section, second section, which is called the Nevi'im, or Nevi'im, that's a Jewish word. It means prophets. Uh, in this section, the list of books in here is Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then uh, it says the 12 minor prophets, and then it lists out Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And then in the third section, it's called the Kethuvim, which means writings, the writings. And in this section, you will find Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Psalms, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. So as you can see, it's the same Hebrew books, but placed in a different order, and obviously a different translation. So um, we will be using this translation in order to avoid you know, long discussions over semantics of translations. Um, because I have no problem using this translation. It's actually a very good translation. Um, it's probably better than a lot of the Christian translations. Uh, which we will figure that out as we go. Um, better in meaning maybe more accurate. Um, but that doesn't take away from being able to teach Christian theology from this translation because it's a translation of the same Hebrew books. And in those Hebrew books, no matter how you translate it, you cannot translate Jesus out of it. It's, it's, uh, he's all over, he's all through it. So. It's not a problem for us to use this translation. Um, now, why are there so many different translations? Maybe we should address that. Um, this, this here, okay. There are there are different uh, sources which we will talk about later at the end of this video because he talks about some different sources for translating for the Hebrew scriptures. Now, this one here has one source which is called the Masoretic Text. And that is uh, through a series of events the uh, the the Masoretic text is uh, the most ancient version of the accepted core Hebrew books that were most likely kept within the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. You see, the, the truth is, is there were some different versions, which we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a couple of different variations, and there was also a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, and these different things around at the time of Jesus that were being used. And after that, a thousand years after that, in fact, we find that the Hebrew rabbi scholars, um, the, the, what they considered the actual holy texts, they uh, were known as the Mesorites, Mesorites. And they compiled this um, collection of books 
and added the vowels because originally they didn't have vowels in in the Hebrew language in the written part of the Hebrew language was only consonants but because the language was falling out of use more and more they figured that they better write uh, make a system to write vowels in in order to preserve it from being lost. Now eventually it was pretty much lost maybe not to only very very few people for a long time but we'll get to that. We'll talk about that later but anyway what we have now is the Masoretic text is the widely accepted original Hebrew Bible and that's this. This is the Tanakh and it's translated mainly only, the, it's, it's focused primarily on the Masoretic text. So this is fine. This is a this is a very good Bible. I have no problem at all with it. Okay, so with that being said, let's uh, meet Rabbi Michael Skolbeck, and we'll uh, listen to him and uh, comment on his teaching as we go. The assertion of Christianity is that God's revelation to the Jewish people and to others did not end with the canonization of the Jewish scriptures, the Tanakh, in approximately 450 BCE. Our Bible, our Jewish Bible, which we call the Tanakh, basically was canonized, was put together in its final form approximately 450 BCE. That was the Jewish Bible. We still have it today. And Christians insist that God's revelation did not end at that time. And they maintain that the Christian scriptures, which were written approximately between the years 55 of the Common Era, to approximately 150, we don't know exactly what the dates are, but approximately 50 to 150 of the Common Era, they claim that those scriptures were also revealed by God and that they have an important message for the Jewish people. Now we all know, if you've ever seen a Jewish Bible, that our Bible does not end our Bible does not end by saying, to be continued. Our Bible does not end by saying, but wait, there's going to be more. That's important to realize. Our Bible never says that. Well, actually, I disagree with that. The uh, Hebrew Bible does say, to be continued. It says it in several places. It's what we call prophecy. Uh, and it's continued right up until the final restoration of, of the earth, which is the end of prophecy, basically, as far as the Hebrew scriptures is concerned. So it does say to be continued. And it does say, and, and uh, he means as far as there will be no more prophets and no more messages. Um, that's not true. It's, it, there will be. And I'll show you here. Now, before we look at this prophecy, um, I want to just set it up a bit. Uh, because my channel is mostly for people who are not familiar with the history and the scriptures. So I like to rehash things a little bit and and inform people of what we're doing and what we're talking about. Before we start reading from this Tanakh, this particular uh, translation of the Tanakh does not have the name of God in it. Um, what they instead of that, they what they've done is they use the word Lord in all capital letters anywhere the name of God appears. Um, 
Now, the name of God in the Hebrew Scriptures is usually, it's called the Tetragon. And what it is, is four consonant letters. Y-H-W-H. Or it could be Y-H-V-H. Either one is, uh, is uh, correct. Now, um, because as I said before, they, they didn't write down the vowels. And the vowels were not written in until 700 years after Christ by the Mesorites. Um, when the Mesorites wrote the vowels in on into the Tanakh, they did not put the correct vowels on the name of God. And the reason they did that was that um, there was such a reverence for the name of God uh, that you never say it, um, not even by accident. In, in, in case you would say it in a way that is uh, worthless or, or in vain. So um, they, uh, they used uh, two different sets of vowels, one or the other, from other words on the name of God. From one, one was from a word uh, called Adonai, which means Lord, and the other one was from the word Elohim, which means God. So they would use the, the vowels from Adonai on the name of God, or the vowels from Elohim on the name of God, depending on the sentence and how the language is flowing, I guess. So that's where we get those names, Jehovah or Yahweh. That's from those sets of vowels, which is incorrect. And um, that was done just so that you would not accidentally say God's name while you were reading it. So um, the, the actual way for sure has been lost. Um, if anybody knows it, it's very, very few people, and I don't see how they, they would still know by now, uh, because the entire thing was lost for a little while. So we will, um, just so you know, and, and when, when the rabbi is speaking, you'll see oftentimes he will say Hashem, and that is another replacement war, word instead of saying the name of God. And Hashem is Hebrew. It means the name. So when you see Hashem, that's what it is. It's the name in the place of where the name of God would be in the scripture. So in this reading, it's Lord. Okay. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is a covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is agreement uh, a solemn agreement made between two people. It's a, a promise to abide by this agreement. So any, any agreement like that is a covenant. Um, a contract is when you, when two people make an agreement, okay, this person might have some idea about this agreement, another person might have some slightly different idea about this agreement. So what they do is they bring the two together and lay out in point form in writing what the agreement is. This is what you will do. This is what I will do. And then we sign it. And that's the contract. So if you think of it, the covenant that way with God, when he brought the people of, e of Israel out of Egypt, and brought them to the mountain and Moses went up in the mountain and he got the Ten Commandments written on the stone tablets by God with his own finger and the agreement was you keep my laws you keep my statutes you keep my ordinances and if you do all that then I will be your God and you shall be my people and this is a, a binding agreement forever. 
and it was signed. Okay, now that was the first covenant, the the covenant under Moses. Okay, and uh, there's another principle we want to take a quick look at here. Is uh, okay during that time when Moses went up on the mountain, God spoke from the mountain to the people, and He said. Exodus chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am, am an impassioned God visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing loving kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. So that comes into play here in our next talk. The other thing that happened, now, in ancient times, 1000 BC, King David ruled over the United Kingdom of Israel. All 12 tribes were united under one king, David. And David's son Solomon, because he sinned and he did some things wrong, the kingdom was divided by God into two kingdoms. Uh, the southern kingdom, which was called Judah, and the northern kingdom, which was called Israel. So the Israel was ten tribes, Judah was two or three. It's a little, there's a, it's a little complicated. There's a, how the tribe of Levi fits in and things like that. But anyway, so it's the ten tribes in the north, the rest of the tribes in the south. Now. Um, King Tiglath Pileser III of Assyria invaded the northern kingdom and took, took, took them away as slaves and destroyed their capital city, wiped them out. And that, even till today, is known as the lost ten tribes of Israel. They're gone into, they got mixed into the nations. They're, they're just gone. Um, now, the tribe of Judah remained, and the, and the kingdom of Judah remained in the south. Later on, another 140, 150 years later, 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and destroyed the kingdom of Judah. He destroyed the temple, and he destroyed the city of Jerusalem and took them captive into Babylon for 70 years and then they came back after 70 years and rebuilt the city and the temple and that is called the, sup the second temple. Now Jeremiah the prophet in the first temple before the king of Babylon came to destroy the city he was the prophet in Jerusalem leading up to the destruction. He was there prophesying, telling them to repent, telling them what God says, and they weren't listening to him, and it led up to the destruction of the city and, and their captivity. So we're going to read from Jeremiah, just so we know what time this prophecy is being given. It's just prior to the destruction of the first temple. Okay, so if Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 27 see a time is coming declares the Lord when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with seed of men and seed of cattle and just as I was watchful over them to uproot and pull down to overthrow and to destroy to bring disaster so I will be watchful over them to build and to plant declares the Lord See, you see, now, at the time he's saying this, Israel's already gone, and Judah is about to be gone. Okay? 
In those days they shall no longer say, Parents have eaten sour grapes, and children's teeth are blunted. But everyone shall die for his own sins. Whosoever eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be blunted. Because, um, because of what I read earlier, of God visiting the sins of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, and visiting uh, loving kindness on the thousandth generation of those who love him and keep his commandments. So they would say, well, our fathers sinned and we're paying for it. So there was this attitude that there's nothing we can do anyway because our father sinned and we are paying for it. So God's saying, those, you will no longer be able to say that. That's going to change. Okay? So then he goes on, starting from where we left off. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It, it will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke. Now what covenant was that? That was the covenant under Moses when he led them out of Egypt with Israel and Judah and he made a covenant with them and they broke the covenant. Okay? Though I espoused them, declares the Lord, though I made them my spouse, but such is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days. With the house of Israel. I will make this covenant with the house of Israel. Not, so it's not Israel and Judah, but it, but it is Israel and Judah. But they're united. Because you can see at the beginning of the prophecy, he said, A time is coming when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of men and the seed of cattle, and I will be watchful, watchful over them to build them up. So it does include Judah. So now then this new covenant that he's going to make, he's reunited Israel and Judah into one nation, Israel. He no longer says Israel and Judah. He's saying, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my teaching into their innermost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. I will teach them myself. I will write it right on their hearts. Then I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So that's it. The same result of the agreement, but God's going to write it on them. It's not, they can't break that. Only God could break that. Okay? No longer will they need to teach one another and to say to one another, Heed the Lord, for all of them, from the least of them to the greatest, shall heed me, declares the Lord. They will all be taught by God directly. For I will forgive their sins and remember their sins no more. Okay? Thus says the Lord, who established the sun for light by day and the laws of moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea into roaring waves, whose name is the Lord of hosts. If these laws could ever be annulled by me, declares the Lord, only then will the offspring of Israel cease to be a nation before me for all time. Okay, so if you could change the laws that make the sun rise at, in the morning, and then make the moon come out at night, and then make the waves in the sea. If you could change those laws, then you can change the fact that the, 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 the sons of Israel will be a nation before God forever. So, 
this is one thing I really like about this translation. You can see um, in Hebrew you will see uh, when you learn the language, there, there's different modes of Hebrew, and uh, one is the like a narrative mode, and then there's a, a, a poetic mode, and uh, you can see how they laid out the text here in the translation. Let's see if I can get this right. See how up here, up here you can see the narrative. And then the poetic part here, and then back to the narrative. So that's a really nice feature of this Bible. And that poetic part is, For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. And as the laws of nature are, so that this uh, that's as sure as the nation of Israel will be. That's the poem. So it's very nice. Um, so there, that says to be continued, doesn't it? It does say to be continued. There's going to be a new covenant. Now, I haven't seen the lost tribes of Israel lately, have you? Have you seen the lost tribes of Israel? No. So this has not happened yet. It is to be continued. Or so they think it hasn't happened. It actually has happened, but we'll get to that later. Okay, that's the end of part one. Uh, I'm going to continue just putting out parts of this series. And I'll just keep putting out half-hour videos from the same series as we go for a while. And we'll see how that goes. Don't forget to share this video wherever you can. And to help uh, to show that what the actual Christian view is instead of what somebody else is trying to define it as.